There are a few points you're going to hear me emphasize over and over as I discuss evolution with you. Number one, and the really, really big one, is that individuals do not evolve, but populations do. Evolution, all the factors um, encouraging evolution act on populations, not individuals. Big point number two is that there are many forms of evolution that we'll discuss that happen slowly over huge periods of time. And finally, number three is that while natural selection is incredibly important and was the first driving force of evolution that was discussed by the scientific community, not only by Charles Darwin, by the way, but lots of other scientists, there are a lot of other forces changing and shaping the populations as they evolve, just as there are a number of ways that we're going to track these changes. So there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. There's lots and lots of cool science at play when we're talking about evolution. So first of all, let's get right down to the molecular changes that are going on here, because you know I love the molecular stuff. Um, so what's at play in one form of evolution, which is microevolution, and that's changes to allele frequencies over time. So breaking that down, populations share gene pools. A gene pool is the sum of all the genes and their alleles for every member of the population. So say for a particular gene B, there would be a dominant allele, big B, for long bristles, their hair, and a recessive allele, little b, for short bristles. And so you could count up, if you had, you know, genetic analysis, you could count up all the homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive individuals, and you could get the proportions of that dominant allele and recessive allele in the population. And that gives you a big term that we're, you're going to hear over and over in this unit, and that's allele frequency, or how often the allele occurs in the population. So in a population of 100, if 40% are homozygous dominant, that's 80 of those dominant B alleles, because each individual has two of them. If 25% are heterozygous, that's 25 more dominant B, and 25 recessive B alleles, and that leaves 35% or 35 individuals that are homozygous recessive. So that gives us another 70 recessive alleles. So if you add all this up, you've got 105 dominant B alleles, and let's speed this up a little bit, and you should have 95 recessive B alleles. That's going to reduce down to 21 out of 19, and so there's your allele frequency. But a change in the allele frequency, so microevolution, means that this frequency is changing. Um, or the frequency of other genes, but we're just talking about the hair bristle genes. So maybe in the future, there's more dominant B alleles. So after 10 generations, maybe it's 30 to 15. The frequency has changed. Populations are always changing. It is, you know, with, with mutations arising and just natural random variation, you're going to see changes in allele allele frequencies. And so one of many factors that can change these allele frequencies is natural selection, and that's what we're going to focus on from here on out. So let's talk natural selection. Charles Darwin is the one that gets credit for the discovery because he compiled most of the convincing early evidence and began his writing first, but he only published because there were other young naturalists, among them Alfred Russell Wallace, but also many others, who are going to explain the same basic principles in their own writing at the same time. And so their work sort of forced Darwin's hand. He knew that this was going to be an unpopular scientific discovery. He had uh, theological training, and he was married to a very, very religious spouse. Um, he, he had this profound understanding of how upset people were going to be um, and how how much this would disrupt the popular thinking of his time. Um, 
his work and the man himself are actually very, very interesting. So um, we're not going to go very deeply into it here, but if you enjoy scientists and biographies, there's some great ones on Charles Darwin and his contemporaries, um, and lots of videos too, if that's more your thing. But we're going to move on to what he discovered. So um, he was the naturalist assigned to work on the HMS Beagle, and that was going to sail around South America. Um, rumor has it that he had a weak stomach and was often seasick, so he would leave the ship at every port they stopped at to collect natural specimens. So there are some of his mockingbird specimens there. And he would preserve those specimens um, and you know, catalog them and send them back to England for their natural history museums. He kept very meticulous records he actually had multiple journals. This is um, a page, you know, lots of these are digitally available now. I think this one's from the Cambridge Library. But these are his geology notes. And so every little rock sample he kept, he would identify um, and, you know, give some background about where they were located and what they looked like. Um, so very, very meticulous records that he linked to these specimens that were then sent um, or shared with other specialists in those fields back in England. So it's really a great look at the nature of science. As you might have heard before, the Galapagos Islands were an important spot for his discoveries. They're a tiny set of islands in the Pacific, and it was easy to observe the species on the different islands because uh, the beagle sailed to all of them and you can see that they're all different distances from each other and some are large and some are small and so that became the foundation of a lot of his observations because he could see that species on the islands were similar to those of the other islands and to the mainland the South American mainland that was eh, you know sort of nearby but they were clearly different, and often each island has it, had its own unique set of species that were only on that island. Um, and the further they were from the, the large island of the group, the more different they were from, you know, the collection of species on the other islands. Um, also, just traveling around South America, Darwin got to observe a wide range of latitudes and so he got to see the tropics and temperate zones and, you know, climates that would have been somewhat familiar to those in Europe. But instead of seeing species like European species that, you know, logic would have said, you know, if the temperature and the climate is similar, the species might be similar. It was the species were similar to others on the continent. So tropical species and temperate species, although they lived in incredibly different environments were similar to each other. And this was, again, it's not very shocking to us now, but at the time that was a really big discovery. It was a, an interesting observation, not one that many people had had a chance to make at the time. 